would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And uh, I always say there's no free lunch. Uh, you have to do a lot of things. But um, I have enjoyed the paper so far. <laughs> and of course, um, the first, um, it's actually um, uh, commenting on uh, Renee's paper. Um, I think uh, Renee's, um, uh, she was very modest. She says that she got her motivation from uh, Hart and uh, Luigi, uh, uh, Zingali's uh, Luigi. But I think uh, what Renee did was actually much more than what they have done. Because it was uh, quite intuitive for um, Oliver Hart to say that, well, uh, shareholders may have um, different preferences. You know, that values will affect shareholders. Because uh, shareholders are not fiduciary of the company. All right, so shareholders tend to be uh, more subjective in their orientation. But uh, to, um, to actually um, move on to say that, well, directors may also be, uh, in their investment decisions, may also be affected by their personal orientation, I think that, that was very interesting. Because uh, from what we have studied, you know, from a lawyer's point of view, or even from a normal objective point of view, directors are supposed to be objective because they are fiduciary. So we always think that directors are um, this superman who has no feeling, okay? And they are supposed to decide okay, all decisions in the best interest of the company. And they are supposed to make very objective um, assessment of every uh, individual situations that come before them. But I think what Renee and her co-authors have done is actually to tie a personal characteristics Okay, to explain to people that directors are actually people as well. They're not superhumans, all right? So I, I thought uh, from that point of view, um, to tie something uh, objective, okay, to uh, their personal or subjective uh, orientation of the directors, that, that was very interesting, okay? And of course, the second portion is actually to extend it to the world, you know? I, I thought that that was re uh, really, really very good. And... Um, and uh, when I read the papers and uh, when I heard uh, Renee's um, um, you know, presentation, the first uh, implication that uh, I can think of is that um, usually when we recruit uh, a new directors, we usually uh, just check on their backgrounds, check on their skill sets, maybe check on their gender, but we have never asked them to take a psychometric test. Maybe, okay, after Renee's paper, we should seriously think about you know, making them go through a psychometric test, you know, and then it's up to the shareholders to decide, do we want a mix of, you know, directors with different uh, orientations on board, or are we more shareholders oriented, you know, because we are family firms, so we want to make sure that, you know, they pay out as, as much as to shareholders. So psychometric tests may be introduced. So that's some suggestion, you know, for your policy implication, right? Uh, yes, I have some queries though. Um, um, I think uh, when I was reading, um, because when I read the paper, it was actually more on Sweden. Of course, you know, culture actually came to my mind. And I think you have explained it very well that yes, after doing, you know, going around the world and, um, you know, trying to come up with some data, uh, culture does matter. Okay, culture does matter. Uh, the other question I wanted to ask was, um, what about the nature of directors? You know, are they uh, executive directors or are they independent directors? Do the nature of directors actually affect um, their decision, their orientation? Because if I'm an executive director, my payout may be tied to shareholders' value in a sense, right? Because um, that, that's how, you know, if shareholders' value is it's high, um, you know, my stock prices goes up, I will get higher pay. So maybe the type of directors may affect um, you know, my orientation. So I'm just talking about some uh, objective factors that may affect, you know, that may affect, you know, shareholders' value, uh, the director's um, decision making. And the second thing is that I think um, uh, the, the experiment that uh, Renee did, the questionnaire that um, Renee did was very good, but uh, like what Renee said, it was actually done individually. All right, so it was done individually. It wasn't done in a group context. So um, um, my question is, does the director's personal value change over time because of groupthink? I think you have only taken um, that point in time, that director, that particular background, and what decision they will make. But if a director has been, has been sitting on board for a few years, um, his orientation or his value system may change because of the group. 
You know, I may be a, 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 share, a stakeholder oriented director, or I may be universally, uh, I may be um, um, benevolent. But because after you know, sitting on board for a while, my orientation may change. So I'm suggesting that uh, maybe what you can do is that you can pick a few directors and follow them through. That means your, your test may be, your paper may be more than five years. All right, you may need to do, uh, uh, okay, five years is okay, or a three year to five years tracking on a particular board and see how that actually, uh, how the board dynamics actually affect personal director's value. All right, so, so that, that's um, something I thought. And thirdly, um, and um, I think what was interesting is that you, um, you group, you and your co-authors group shareholders as one category and stakeholders as the other category. Okay, but there is no distinction between the different kind of stakeholders. Even though your vignettes actually, you know, they have different kind of uh, situations, some uh, for the customers and some for um, creditors. But uh, would you be able to extend your test further, you know, to look at whether some of these characteristics, whether directors have actually different preferences, you know, towards different kind of stakeholders. Yeah, so, so th that's, that's a minute point that I think may be a bit difficult, you know, to go, to go that, um, that detail, but I thought that would be interesting as well. So that's, um, that's um, some suggestions for, you know, Renee's paper. I thought that would be, you know, that would add a little bit more excitement to your paper. Coming back to uh, Gerard's paper, it's, it's, it's a very attractive proposal, I would say, because that's an issue that's facing a lot of countries now, paying out of pension funds, and how do you design pension funds for the future? You know, maybe now it's, uh, it's not easy to change, you know, but um, in uh, future generations, uh, how would we design uh, pension funds? Um, uh, th there's only two questions. One of the first question is, um, other than age, I think uh, your division was between, asset allocation was between uh, just age, young and old. Would, uh, I was just thinking, would gender, would gender and background of the people be, be important as well? For instance, if I'm, I'm from a, a rich family, all right, I'm, I'm actually from a rich family, okay, maybe I don't depend so much on pension funds, Right? I may actually depend, I may want to invest in some other things, even though I may have, um, I, I'm just talking from a Singapore experience. All of us, when we work, we have to pay um, Central Provident Fund. All right? But I won't depend so much on our CPF, Central Pro Provident Fund, because I'm, I'm richer, I'm, I'm from a rich family. So maybe family background may actually affect as well. You know, background, whether the person is rich or uh, poor, that may actually affect asset uh, allocation in his choice. And also um, gender. You know, for women, we are a bit more risk averse. Okay, generally, I think if you do uh, from literature, g uh, women are more risk averse. So um, the, we may be, you know, more towards bonds rather than equity. So that may be some of the things that you can control for it or, you know, or, you know can, can consider as factors. The other one is that uh, for orientations of beneficiaries, um, that was the second, second, way, of, um, as, uh, second way of giving a beneficiaries a, a, a say. Um, I was just thinking whether that might, be, um, might depend on the type of funds Okay, it might depend on the type of funds because, um, yes, like you said, pension funds might be age-oriented, but other type of funds may take in other, uh, uh, more, more factors. For instance, um, individual investments may, okay, for instance, because you, you, the, the, the second choice was between shareholder or stakeholder orientation. But I think for, for um, if it's a pension fund, I would concern more about myself you know, uh, the payout in the sense, all right? But if I'm actually investing in mutual fund and all that kind of thing, I may think a little bit more on stakeholders orientation. So th that may also depend on the type of funding as to how a beneficiary would choose. I, I don't know, I'm just uh, thinking aloud, you know, when, when I'm uh, listening to, to the presentation. All right, so th uh, those are some of my comments and uh, maybe we can talk a little bit more. Um, yeah, that's for, that's for me. Okay, thank you, Lulu. Our next commentator is Konsa Kim from Seoul National University.
Uh, thank you also very much uh, for coming. And also, I, I thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to this uh, wonderful uh, conference. I have been learning a lot, but I have to perform <laughs> a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't get uh, the papers. Uh, and uh, Professor Kanda told me that uh, you have to speak uh, for about five minutes. And so I prepared the memo. Uh, otherwise, I will just uh, keep going and going. <laughs> so. Uh, let me first uh, read my uh, two-page memo first, and then I will uh, make uh, uh, one comment for each uh, uh, presentation. Uh, in 1986, uh, that was 30 years ago, I published a paper on a topic somewhat related to uh, the concept of CSR. Uh, that is about the only paper uh, that I have published on CSR, and I am by no means an exception. Uh, until recently, the CSR or stakeholder interest has been a marginal issue at best uh, for most of the scholars uh, in Korea. But things are cha uh, changing slowly in recent years. Uh, CSR is becoming popular, not only in the business community, but also among corporate law scholars like me. The rise of CSR in Korea may be due to a growing realization among the general public that the market if they're left alone, does not ameliorate but exacerbate social problems. In this respect, Korea is not different from other developed countries. I'd like to share with you a few of my personal observations of CSL activities in Korea. First of all, let me point out that the local Korean culture is quite receptive to CSL at the conceptual level. Uh, Confucianism, still remains relatively strong in Korean society. As you all know, Milton Friedman argued that uh, the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. Uh, such an argument is something that most Koreans find hard to embrace, at least openly. Uh, Koreans would be still attracted to Mencius, uh, Meng Tzu, uh, a great Confucian sage who preached benevolence and righteousness instead of profit. So, taking into account of the interests of those outside the firm uh, goes well with the Confucian tradition. But the reality of CSR activities in Korea does not seem to comport with our Confucian legacy. First, Korean firms are not yet actively engaging in philanthropy. As of uh, 2013, the COSPI, uh, that's a major index, COSPI 200 firms spent on average 0.5% uh, of the revenue on philanthropy, uh, which is up from 0.14% in uh, 2011. Also, Koreans, Korean investors are not enthusiastic about uh, CSR either. Uh, the total sum of so, I mean, social responsibility in, uh, investment funds in Korea amount to uh, about uh, $7 billion uh, dollars as of uh, 2015. Again, 0.5% uh, of the market capitalization. Second, CSL has been often exploited from ulterior motives. Many uh, big business groups now have uh, charitable foundations. And critics argue that the foundations are employed primarily for tax saving purposes. And more recently, some uh, uh, travel owners who were indicted on criminal charges set up charitable foundation in a show of repentance to secure more lenient criminal sanction from the judges. Let me now mention a recent empirical study on CSR activities in Korea. The authors have found that as the ownership of controlling shareholders decreases, CSR activities increases. Why do controlling shareholders spend more for a CSR when their ownership percentage is lower? There may be uh, many uh, possible answers. One possible answer may be uh, that uh, the, the possibility of Controlling shareholders uh, may try to abuse CSR to seek their personal uh, private benefit of control. 
Let me now conclude. I believe that the primary goal of policymakers in Korea uh, still should be to minimize the agency cost arising from the conflict between the controlling shareholders and minority shareholders. Although the interest in CSR is on the rise, uh, the CSR is not and should not be a, a mainstream issue in Korea. In the absence of sophisticated corporate governance mechanism, uh, the controlling family may abuse its power on the excuse of CSR. And let me now turn to uh, the, my comments uh, on uh, these presentations. Uh, first, uh, Professor Adams' uh, presentation. Uh, and you have uh, surveyed uh, directors, right? Uh, but uh, you know, uh, controlling shareholder uh, jurisdictions. Uh, what's important is the, the mindset of controlling shareholders instead of uh, directors. In Korea, at least, uh, controlling shareholders uh, tend to think that the, uh, the funds in uh, their firm uh, belongs to him and him only. So uh, they don't like, uh, I mean, this uh, uh, directors uh, to spend uh, uh, their own money for other purposes. So in order to get, you know, this kind of philanthropy or just donations from uh, uh, the companies, you should contact the owner of the firm, not uh, the board. And uh, another aspect is that uh, the controlling shareholders' attitude is kind of ambivalent. When they uh, uh, deal with uh, the uh, employees, uh, they emphasized the interest of shareholders. It's, it's very important to you know, just pursue the, uh, the sh shareholder uh, interest. And, but when they are faced with the uh, threat from outside, like you know, foreign investors, especially I mean, the hedge funds uh, uh, from the United States, uh, they emphasized you know, long-term value, you know, CSR, that kind of thing. You know, Short-term uh, shareholder gain is not you know, something we should uh, pursue. So it's kind of an ambivalent. And now let me move to uh, the Agile paper. Uh, listening to his presentation, I uh, was reminded of a, a uh, paper written by my former teacher, uh, Professor Robert Clark, about these four stages of uh, capitalism. And he says that, uh, basically he said that you know, they, this is a kind of you know, division of labor, right? Separation, separation on, and of ownership and you know, control. And then this kind of, you know, this, uh, this investment management business. And then to the, the final stage is kind of a you know, pension fund. Uh, so you don't really, uh, what to say, uh, trust the judgment of uh, these people, so you just force them to, you know, put some money <laughs> for their uh, their forced retirement uh, uh, period, and in a sense, it's a kind of an uh, like an opposite direction. <laughs> so I, I'm curious to know uh, what uh, y your thought uh, about this uh, point is. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Kansik. And our last commentator is uh, Professor Gen Goto from the University of Tokyo. Okay, well, um, so uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Kanda for giving me this opportunity to comment on these uh, two great presentations. And uh, also, and as someone from the host country, I would also like to thank everyone from abroad uh, for visiting Japan, and which is uh, always great to have uh, many friends come visit you. Okay, so, um, so I'd like to first comment on Rune's paper. Um, it's very interesting. and. Um, so I tried to make some uh, specific comments on your uh, what you did. Uh, my first uh, comment is on the your questionnaire or uh, vignettes that you mentioned, and uh, for the especially the last one on the corporate philosophy. And uh, this corporate philosophy is like. Um, Oh, um, so all the four uh, minutes from you taken up from the uh, concrete uh, case case law is uh, asking the directors how you are going to decide. But this uh, question on the corporate philosophy is not what you would like or you are going to do, but um, how you want to present yourself. So this is not. Um, so this might be asking that 
not how you are thinking, but how you want to be seen from the outsiders. And uh, your paper on the Sw Sweden Swedish directors showed that uh, on this questionnaire, uh, everyone answered took the position uh, taking a side of the stakeholders. So uh, it's and it's quite possible that you want to be seen that you're a nice person. So uh, this may be um, introducing some um, twist here. So maybe you want to try to take, take out this um, answer to this questionnaire and see how it's going to change. Well, maybe it doesn't, but um, I think it's a uh, different kind of things. And also, um, you showed, um, what just right was it? Um, on the slide 19, you show the uh, table with uh, farm country fixed effects. And I was very surprised to see that, well, for the US farms, they was actually uh, statistically significantly negative, that US farms directors actually take care of the stakeholders, which is um, quite counterintuitive. And on the other hand, German, German corporations directors are, well, no significance. So it, it's kind of a counterintuitive. So I would like to hear what, why this came up. And also when you include director, uh, directors, country fixed effects, these uh, significance disappear. But uh, you didn't uh, show that, um, well then how about the, if, if, whether there's any difference between the um, US born directors and German born directors, well, I, maybe, if, you, if there's any Japanese included, I guess they are quite uh, on the negative side, but uh, that would be one interesting point to see. And, on, and my final point is that um, it relates with the comment by Lulu that um, she mentioned that uh, whether there's any difference between the nature of the director, whether she's uh, executive or independent or other things. But I think that one another uh, interesting aspect to see is the whether he's um, a founder, the founder of the firm, or the, from the founding family. And that was the point of the uh, Hart and Zingras paper, that uh, whether a um, founder can impose the later directors to take care of the more of the stakeholders. So um, w one possibility is that, well, founders care about stakeholders, but the professional managers don't. So that would be one point to check. And I was, and I guess that there might be a difference between countries, as, as Professor Kim mentioned, uh, Korean controlling families and founders seem not to care about the stakeholders, but uh, maybe in US, it's more like uh, Henry Ford or the uh, Mr. Regri seems to take care of the stakeholders. So that, that's another thing you can do. And uh, also for, uh, Gerald's paper. Well, I, I have to thank uh, very much because, uh, well, having more than 30 years to start receiving pension, I have never thought of, about this problem seriously. <laughs> so uh, it's just very uh, good opportunity for me. And um, and uh, so my, but my question is that well, um, I didn't uh, because uh, I have never studied about pension seriously. I didn't understand your. Um, aim very much because uh, your proposal sounded to me like um, like usual uh, 401k in US, the defined contribution plan, that you, the firms just contribute to your uh, account and you decide where to invest. And so, but uh, on the outset you mentioned that uh, but even with defined contribution approach, there's a problem of underfunding and the expected returns may not be materialized. So. Uh, uh, my question is how your proposal helps with this uh, defined contribution plans problem. And, um, and also, well, because this session is about the stakeholders' interest, um, but, uh, and you, of course, mentioned about the stake, uh, stakeholders and uh, social and environmental impact invest investing, investment, but um, I think it very much that why taking impact investing helps with underfunding problem. I believe it's more about the profit. And um, well, of course, there's a possibility that uh, investing in like green economy or those kind of um, social firms pro uh, produce more profit. But then it's just about the profit. And if that, um, if investing in social and environmental firms increase the profit, then there should be some kind of uh, in mutual funds that focus on that aspect. So 
I, I didn't get very much that why you wanted to include this point. And my final point is that uh, while proposing this or this proposal, uh, you mentioned that well, so opt-in would be 20% own choice and 80%. Uh, but if you wanted to let the each beneficiaries to decide, then why not say like 50-50 or more 80% own and 20% fund money? I, well, of course, I, I know that there's no um, logical answer to this question, but I just wondered why uh, it sounded to me that you took a quite um, a moderate approach. Um, if you have any ideas behind these numbers, I'd like to hear about it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ken. Uh, let's give a few minutes to Renee and Gerard to respond. All right, thanks very much for the excellent comments, um, especially because this is work in progress. This will be very helpful. Uh, and it's funny that um, uh, both um, uh, Professor Lan and Professor Goto said we should decompose the index because in rereading my paper after a couple of years, I was like, why didn't we de decompose the index? Uh, and it makes, of course, perfect sense to look whether uh, some countries emphasize employees more, some countries uh, the creditor issue is more important, right? So that's um, on the research agenda. Um, and uh, yeah, excellent comments. Uh, why do we not survey controlling shareholders? Um, if I knew how to survey them, I would. Um, it's actually not so easy if you think about who who do you actually survey, right? And I think uh, the chart about ownership structure in, in China, where do you actually go to survey them, right? So it's not so obvious, uh, but I do, I take that into, um, I think that's a well, um, an important point. Like, are we finding anything that actually matters? I would say probably we are, but um, how much does it matter? We don't really know, right? And so um, now one thing that we do have is, uh, for example, in Sweden, uh, we do know the ownership structure of the companies. Um, and this is something we haven't done yet, but it would be interesting to see whether the ownership structure affects what type of director values uh, are on the board. Um, now, uh, also this issue of founders, uh, we do know who the founders are in Sweden, so we can look, and I've done a little bit of looking at um, family firms in Sweden using the same data, and uh, one interesting thing that um, I've found is uh, that uh, family firms and founders tend to be more conservation-oriented. Uh, that's one of the values. Uh, they tend to be more conservation-oriented and more tradition-oriented, which is sort of interesting because uh, you might think you know, they're more entrepreneurial. Uh, well, being on tradition-oriented and conservation-oriented is not really entrepreneurial, but it probably explains why family firms stay as family firms instead of selling out. Um, so I think there are some interesting issues around founders. And um, <clears throat> I should also do a little plug for some future work. Uh, we've done the same survey in Turkey, where there's also a lot of family ownership. And so we're going to look at, you know, try to do a, you know, see whether the family ownership structure matters in Sweden and Turkey and in this cross-country sample. So um, thanks very much for the comments. Thank you. Let me take the questions in the easiest order. So first, why 20%? Well, it's just a political economy consideration. If you say 100%, it's easy to destroy it by saying the people are not able to do that. And 20%, what's the risk? Not much. And second, the second consumer protection element is you pick among the choices made by the pension fund management. So you don't have to make your own decisions like under a 401k, you, you have a finite, finite set. Okay, so that limits a bit the intervention, for, the reason to intervene from the outside, because if you say this set is dangerous, well, you have bigger problem than my little pro proposal, right? It means that pension funds are badly managed. So I, I give them the benefit of the doubt uh, and, and assume this. So 20% so, so for political economy reasons. Um, now, will it make a difference? You know, maybe not. That, that, you know, so if, you, if you're not interested, then you just change the asset allocation and you limit yourself at that. If you're more interested in the, the individual picks, then you, have, you, you want to give some color, right? You, you want to say, I give you a choice and you can do impact investing and it tell you what it is and many financial institutions do that themselves for competitive returns. Now, the weakness there, I agree, is you know, how can you do, at the same time, impact investing and have competitive returns? You know, it, it looks like something that is not, something wrong there, but at least that's what they pretend they do. So at least you give that, and then the stakeholder, shareholder value that I put is, well, you know, it's the current debate, so I didn't want to come with another category, and, and it, it, it's just a question of framing and uh, how, how you describe it, and at least, 
I assume, as you said, also that women, rich people, others might have different preferences. So you might pick about this. But if you start making a sophisticated proposal, well, you know, I can also put this cold paper in the garbage can, which I made to in the end anyway, uh, because it cannot fly. So it's just, you know, what could be flying? And making the only choice about asset allocation and making just that proposal is pretty boring, right? So we don't want to stop there. All right, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, let me just sort of start in the back. Um, yeah, Zen. Uh, I'm Zen Shishiro from Hitotsubashi University. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful presentation from two professors. Uh, this is uh, a uh, question to Professor Adams. And, uh, uh, I am personally very interested in your survey, and I, I believe it's a very significant effort. Uh, uh, and one, one thing, first of all, uh, it looks like so far you did not involve Japan as a target company. But I, I believe that uh, Japanese history for the last 30 years is a tremendous uh, case example for your purpose. So I uh, really uh, uh, hope you will take Japan uh, in uh, the next stage of the, your survey. And the uh, 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 very specific, specific question uh, is the, uh, I think it's already uh, 20 years ago or so, uh, a Japanese economist made a, a very similar survey and but raised a simple question. Uh, if your company has insufficient funds, maybe the decreasing of the profit, then you, CEO, would you, will you uh, choose to decrease the dividend to shareholder or lay off employees? And the result was very, very uh, astonishing. And the, uh, uh, in the United States, more than 90% of the CEO uh, answered, of course, lay, lay off people. And in Japan, more than 90% CEO said, of course, we will decrease or stop paying dividends. Uh, did you raise that same question or not? And if not, I would like to ask you to, to put this question into your survey. I, I, I feel if you, if you do the same question uh, in, to Japanese CEOs, that percentage will ha have been changed a lot uh, since last for 20 years. And uh, also, uh, I would say you, your conclusion is personal value appears to matter and c culture appears to matter. Uh, it's very, very plausible, and I think uh, that may be yes. But probably the possibility is uh, other factors rather than the culture or personal belief affect more. Uh, the uh, Japanese uh, history tells us the, uh, well, you know, even though that uh, CEO, the uh, Japanese CEO 20 years ago believed in uh, the uh, employee's interest is the most important thing, but what did they do for during the last 20 years? They not, they not lay off the people, but they decreased the uh, labor, labor forces by uh, soliciting uh, the uh, uh, early retirement, by paying the severity payment. And uh, so they were forced to do that because of the change of the market and the change of the uh, uh, stockholder, uh, uh, stockholding uh, uh, structure you know, the uh, decreasing of the uh, close shareholding and the increase of the institutional investors. Uh, now the Japanese CEOs, most Jap used to, J Japanese CEOs are very openly to tell told the, uh, the media, I never care for shareholder interest. Uh, 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 we, I will care first the uh, honorable customer's interest. We call uh, them not not only shoshisha, okyakusama. Uh, okyakusama is honorable uh, customers, consumers, uh, and employees. I, the, I never care for the shareholders. But now, uh, in this moment, most uh, Japanese CEOs 
would answer. Uh, uh, I, I, will, I would like to uh, manage this company for the interest of shareholders and other stakeholders, including uh, honorable customers and employees and uh, uh, local community. So the, the, uh, I would, So my question is, is that that change is because of the change of the culture or personal belief or just because of the change of the market? So that's my question. All right, excellent questions, um, very hard questions. Uh, so first, why is Japan not in the survey? And actually, that's a good question. I'm not sure if it's because no Japanese director answered the survey, uh, or if we didn't actually get any email addresses from Japan. So, um, uh, but um, <laughs> uh, but uh, that's a great, um, I would love to do more. And so if, um, if you think Japan is a place where this would fly and anyone wants to co-author, uh, I would be more than happy to, um, to collaborate with someone. Um, now, uh, and I would love to get that reference. Uh, we don't have that specific question from the Japanese studies, but I would love to get that reference so we can see what types of questions people have asked. Um, now, the question about uh, do other things matter more, I think that's um, it's an incredibly important and very hard question to answer, right? Um, so what's the economic significance of personal beliefs, culture, law, institutions, and market forces? very difficult to answer, right? And so we're, we're just scratching the surface. In some sense, what we're trying to say here is um, uh, decision-making is more difficult than we generally give directors credit for. Um, now, how do they, in the end, arrive at the decisions they make? It's hard to say, right? So I'm hoping that um, we can start looking at these questions and maybe you know, with more studies like this, we can do a time series or something that was another suggestion, actually do a time series, it would be fascinating, right? Do beliefs change over time? Presumably they do. Culture changes over time, right? Slowly, but it does. So um, very good questions and sorry, I don't have all the answers, but. Uh, Professor Tanaka. Hello, my name is Wataru Tanaka. I, I'm a uh, professor at the University of Tokyo. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank uh, both, uh, both professors uh, for very insightful uh, presentations. And uh, uh, I'd like to uh, make, a, make a comment and uh, possibly one question to uh, Professor Adams. Uh, um, the comment is, uh, as uh, I, I think uh, Lulu Lan uh, made a comment about that, uh, I strongly would like to would like you to categorize uh, categorize uh, uh, stakeholders more specifically. Uh, um, especially, uh, I'd like to categorize divide divide employees employees uh, uh, into some uh, subcategories. Uh, wh why uh, the reason why I think is uh, uh, employees employees must be divided at least three categories, existent regular employees, existent non-regular employees, and would-be employees. That is, uh, uh, people who, who want to become employees but uh, have not yet been, become. Uh, um, in Japan, in Japan, uh, Japanese uh, directors or managers are said to said to be very labor oriented. They are uh, they are believed to be sympathetic uh, to employees, but uh, in my opinion, this generalization is uh, uh, too uh, too uh, inaccurate. Inaccurate. Uh, the accurate uh, accurate understanding is that uh, Japanese directors are very sympathetic to existent regular employees. Uh, because uh, uh, because they are uh, they are on the top of a uh, uh, seniority sy seniority system and they are, they have natural sympathy sympathy to their colleagues, but uh, they are not uh, they are not so much uh, sympathetic uh, to uh, non regular em employees and they have no no sympathy to would be employees. Uh, and actually, they are hostile hostile to would be employees uh, uh, because uh, uh, because uh, if if companies uh, hire hire new employees, it is very difficult to fire them. So, uh, so natural tendency is to hesitate to uh, hire new employees. 
And、uh, in, this, uh, in this, they have no, no hesitation to be hostile to would be employees because they have, they have no sympathy、uh, to, towards them. So, so if, if the, your, your conduct uh, is uh, uh, what, uh, how, how, how much they are sympathetic to、uh, employees,、uh, I strongly recommend you to、uh, categorize employees. Uh, I, I think that this is, I, I believe it is a very variable, variable uh, 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 research. And what the, the, question, the question is uh, uh, also uh, very, uh, very abstract. Uh, so to, I, my uh, my uh, interest is uh, is about uh,、um, policy policy implication of the, this this kind of research.、Uh, your uh, your research sh- seems to show that、uh, society which are、uh, which are more、uh, more stakeholder stakeholder oriented、uh, tends to have more stakeholder oriented law. Law,、uh, at least in terms of co- co-determination.、Uh, my concern is、uh, if society uh, is uh, stakeholder oriented and the law is also stakeholder oriented, then overall result is too much stakeholder oriented.、Uh, so, uh, I, so my, my concern is how much,、uh, if, if, if my concern is right,、uh, then、uh, how society can avoid. Avoid this result. One, one solution is might, might be, might be uh, make, uh, make uh, company law, judgment law,、uh, rather than、uh, statutes, because statutes, are very, uh, dem- uh, statutes tend to, uh, tend to um, uh, sorry, uh, reflect, reflect the attitude of the general public, while, while judgment law might, might,、uh, might be able to avoid. Avoid such a、uh, such a tendency, but, but, but、uh, of course,、uh, of course,、uh, it is it depends on the、uh, how how judges are educated, how judges are、uh, trained.、Uh, of, this is one of my concerns. Of course,、uh, your your research is uh, now uh, very positive, positive. So implica-、uh, uh, policy implication is not the central concern of your research. But、uh, if you you have some idea, I'd like to、uh, hear you. Thank you. All right. So thanks very much、uh, for those comments.、Um, uh, yeah, we cannot currently, so we can divide into different types of stakeholders, but obviously we can't divide into different types of employees. It's a great、um, suggestion for、um, when we do the survey again, as I assume we might.、Um, <clears throat> so thanks very much for that comment.、Uh, and I, the point that you raised about policy implications, I think that's、um, also, again, a tough one, but really interesting because one thing that you might have noticed. Um, and sorry, I know it goes very quickly, but、uh, the less developed countries had more, directors were more shareholder oriented in the less developed countries. And you might think, well, but actually that's not the way it should be, right? It should be the other way around because in the less developed countries, maybe the companies are the ones who can actually do the things that are good for society, right? Because society is not functioning well, and so who can do it? Maybe it's the companies. So why are they shareholder oriented? And in Switzerland,、uh, which has good institutions, why do directors need to be、uh, stakeholder oriented? Why aren't they shareholder oriented, right? So it seems、um, there's too much stakeholder interest in one case and too little in the other, right? So how can one fix this? And so,、um, so my first reaction is well, maybe there is a case for diversity, right? So one has to potentially, I mean, there's a big movement around the world to, for example, this、uh, movement to have gender diversity. Maybe one should also think about cultural diversity and、um, you know, having more foreigners sitting on boards. I mean, that's sort of. Potentially an easy fix, or you know, that might be a way to say, well, one can implement it、um, in an easy way without changing the laws or changing the, judi- the judicial system, right? But,、um, but that would be my first reaction.、Uh, now,、uh, Lulu mentioned doing like, some psychometric tests, right? So that might be another way, right? Is,、uh, that might be a bit radical, right? But、um, you know, People have、uh, IQ tests for employees, so why not for directors have psychometric tests, right? I mean, that could be another thing to do. Now, of course, an important question is well, how do you, you know, if you have diverse、um, values, diverse orientations on the board, how do they aggregate? We don't understand this yet.、Um, but I would assume that more diversity should lead to different、uh, opinions than less diversity, right? And so,、um, so I think, yeah. 
interesting question. Maybe diversity is at least a small step towards fixing potential problems. Okay, we have limited time. There's a number of hands up, so I'm going to group questions. So Professor Coffey, uh, Professor Puchniak, and Professor Gould, please. Okay, uh, start with me. Sure. Uh, I want to go back to the question that we were borrowing uh, from the Oxford corporate governance debate, and it's the Hart question. I'm sorry. It's the Henry Hart question about maybe it is possible that shareholders really do have preferences beyond profit maximization. And my suggestion is that's probably where attitudinal research should begin because there may be a huge mismatch here. In other words, and I'm being um, quite open to the line of research, but I want to suggest what it best focuses on. In all countries where we have institutional investors constituting a majority of the shareholders, we have, as a consequence that, of that, a system in which uh, agents are electing agents. That is, the officers and directors of the institutional investor elect the officers and directors of the particular corporation. Uh, whether that matches at all the preferences of the underlying pensioner or the underlying mutual fund shareholder who never votes, we don't have a clue. And it would be interesting to see what are the preferences of the typical director at company X and not what are the preferences of the directors of the, of the uh, pension fund or the mutual fund, but what are the underlying preferences of the shareholder who is represented possibly well, possibly poorly, we don't know, by this system of two or three tier structure. And I suggest that's what I think would be the future of this kind of a research. Uh, it's interesting to know that women and men are different, but I'd like to know what the ultimate owner really wanted if he had perfect representation. I just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah uh, this is also for Renee, a fascinating paper. Um, but I think I may have misunderstood it a little bit because uh, to me, um, I actually think it may be shown to me that culture doesn't matter at all. Um, and this is why, uh, and I'm not sure if I understood your proxy right, but if I understood your proxy for culture, it was labor protection, right? That, that countries with stronger labor uh, protection uh, have directors that are more stakeholder oriented, and then you use that as a proxy for culture. Um, but then I don't know that that's really testing how, we, how a lot of the literature and, and people that study culture really view culture. And let me give you concrete examples. Um, for instance, nobody would say that Japan and Germany have the same culture, um, but they both protect uh, uh, employees very strongly. Nobody would say that Singapore and the United States have strong culture, but they both have very weak protection for labor rights. So I think you found something very interesting that when you first said it, it's fascinating and still is fascinating, which is countries that don't provide protection for employees have directors that are stakeholder, or, or, or that uh, if they provide strong protection for employees, uh, they're stakeholder-oriented directors. But I don't know that ex how can you expand that to culture. And this goes back to Professor Kim's point about Confucian culture. I don't think this gets it a at all, in, in the sense that this is totally divorced. You, you may have Confucian culture, you may have uh, uh, Middle Eastern culture, um, European culture, and, and I don't know how that tracks with the labor point. So uh, to me, I, in fact, you've showed something quite interesting, which is that you, you, you could be from Japan or Germany, and because of the strong labor protection, you've shown that. But it shows that the Japanese or the German, that this trumps culture, in fact, that, that your preference for labor protection is more important than culture. This is something to do with both of you, uh, but directly is to Renee's. Uh, also, some related to the Jack's point. Uh, um, during your speech, I can't help thinking the, the questions uh, egg and chicken, uh, the causations. Uh, in another word, uh, is that uh, the director's uh, its, uh, uh, priorities, its characters define the company's attitude toward the social responsibilities? Uh, or vice versa, as the, the, you know, the share structures, uh, the social values norm of the companies uh, decide uh, who will be the directors, pick up the directors. Uh, uh, I think in cer to a certain extent, uh, it's pretty murky. Uh, 
Of course, uh, the requirement for the diversity, the background, the gender balance uh, might complicate it at even further. So my question is, uh, how do you handle that uh, question? Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Jack. That's a, you know, it would be great to look at the shareholders. And I was thinking, as you were saying this, I was like, well, you're asking the impossible. Um, but actually, I was thinking maybe it is possible because, for example, in Sweden, you can get um, data on individual shareholders. And at the very least, one could look at the characteristics of individual shareholders. And I'm not sure if anyone's done that. People have looked at their holdings, but I'm not sure if people looked at individual characteristics of shareholders and how that maps to, for example, the directors who sit on the board. And that might actually be an interesting thing to do. Yeah, so if one can get the data, that could be interesting. I'm, maybe one can do it in a survey, but yeah, so that's an interesting idea, and thanks for um, uh, what sounds like a really difficult project, but. <laughs> um, yeah, Dan, actually, um, so to both of you, the paper is far too early to, like, at this point, there's no causation, right? So we're not claiming anything here. Okay, so this is really just, you know, here's the data, here's what we have, we see some interesting patterns, right? So causation is not there yet. Um, will we be able to establish causation? I'm not sure. So there's no, there's survey data, right? Um, uh, for the Swedish data, we actually have an instrument to try and uh, address um, sample response bias. But response bias is different from trying to figure out the causal direction between, um, you know, values and outcomes, which is a totally different thing, right? So. So I'm not sure we can ever address this. Um, we're not making any causal claims at this point. Maybe we will down the line. So we have to understand the data better. Um, and maybe thinking about causality, we can design a better survey in the future where we might be able to actually tease this out. Um, the culture, yeah, um, so the, the labor protection is not really supposed to be the culture. Um, there was a second slide where we had, um, uh, and sorry, it went all very quickly, and the variable names were horrific uh, because you know I did it last minute trying to get everything ready um, but uh, but we have for example there's the Ingelhart and Weltzel um, uh, world value survey cultural dimensions and so so they characterize countries as um, for example uh, traditional countries versus um, uh, rational countries. So that's a cultural dimension. And so what we see is that the more rational countries are less um, uh, are less shareholder oriented. So that goes. So that's one cultural dimension. So their their culture seems to matter. Another re reason why I say culture seems to matter is um, country fix effects show up significantly, right? So so you do see that countries differ in their levels, their average levels of shareholder orientation. Now we have much more work to do in terms of mapping to culture, right? So this is very very preliminary, right? So so. But I do think there is some evidence to suggest that culture matters, right? So um, maybe I'm overstating my claims here, but, uh, but I do think that there are some. <laughs> All right, well, let's, uh, we've come to the end of our session. Let's give a big round of applause to the presenters. And thank you.